All right, uh, here we go. Uh, hello, everybody. This is Josh, uh, or also known as like the Lens of Yashu for the TLOI podcast, and you're tuning into TLOI Talks episode three. And uh, today we have a very special guest today, uh, well known in much music as probably like one of the biggest highlights through the Fromage series, as well as through various like countless interviews and with his latest. Um, program the new music nation a program that could help that helps out independent artists showcasing their music videos and showcasing a real life much music but more in the sense of canadian programming and such for independent acts and for independent programming i give you ed the sock so ed how are you doing today i almost fell asleep during that introduction my (laughs) god how long did that thing go on for i think i think we're finished now it went on so long yeah i know it's uh, been crazy so far you know like usually i don't do like very like big introductions like usually for episodes usually like when i do my interviews i just go straight to it but you should, you should stick with that <laughs> yeah but with uh, much music legacy in the building you know how are you doing so far man so far in this interview or so far in life either way just fine <laughs> ah yeah i mean to like I just everything so far, you know, I think like everything, like it's been a good process here and there too, like new music nation and everything else too. So yeah. Can't complain. <laughs> yeah, no doubt, no doubt. So I want to get into um, like the first part of part one of the podcast. So that would make just, sense since we're just starting. Yeah, <laughs> I guess so too, man, you know, so um you know, much music, you know, like, sadly, like, it has been into shambles, like, you've talked about it, I've noticed it too, but, you know, you've, like, back then, during the, your time, you've worked with, like, a lot of dope people, you know, like, with Master T, uh, George uh, Shambalopoulos, uh, Rick Campanelli, Erica M, and everyone like that, and, you know, I just wanted to get, like, within the basis of that, like, what was it like working for mu- much music uh, back then, and, what were some interesting moments or stories that you could tell that the general public doesn't know with either you or the DJs? Well, just to correct you, I never worked with Erica M. The uh, first time I actually talked to Erica M was about two months ago with her podcast called the, uh, the reinvention of the VJ. I think it was called. That was the first time in all the years that we talked to each other. Cause I was coming in as she was leaving. And so there was never really any opportunity to, uh, to cross over. Uh, I don't think I even said boo to her in the early days because we just were never there at the same time. Um, working with uh, people like uh, George, with Rick, with Bradford, with Rachel, with Nam, uh, with Amanda, uh, uh, Rainbow, these were all, and Master T, of course, you mentioned. Um, we were all, uh, I mean, we, we were doing a job that nobody else in the media was doing. So that sort of bound us together with a common experience that nobody else could share. So we could understand things that others, you know, about our conditions or our working uh, process that other people didn't understand because they didn't have the same type of job. And uh, I would say that uh, we're all, still family in a way some of them some like i keep in touch with some i don't uh or keep in touch with very rarely but there's that that bond that uh that we all share as for um (coughs) excuse me too many cigars as for uh stories that nobody knows hmm you have to think on that because I've been pretty open about telling stories, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I'm trying to, I, I've been trying to think of what is a story that nobody knows. I mean, there's, it depends if you, what you've heard me talk about before or not. There were, uh, I mean, the first time I did an interview, the first time I was allowed to do an interview on much, it was with uh, the Headstones, the heavy, the uh, hard rock band, and the uh, lead singer. Um, oh, why is his name escaping me now? Um, because he was in, uh, he was in Flashpoint. He's an actor. Hugh, 
Yeah, Hugh. Um, so my, it, there was like a, a back and forth with me and Hugh. And it was like very, it seemed very hostile. And it seemed like we were going to fight each other. But it was all just for the cameras. But the person who runs Much Music was watching. And she was afraid it was actually going to turn into a, like a physical fight. So she uh, pulled, like she, she stopped the interview. She made us uh, like go to a commercial break because she thought that we were actually going to come to blows over that. And we both were like, what are you talking about? We're, we're making television here. Uh, and I've seen him many times in the years since, and we always get along. So that's just, uh, that's my first ever interview. They never let me host an intermittent interactive because I don't know why, you know, they, it, it's not as if I didn't talk to big celebrities. I did. And it's not as if the celebrities didn't enjoy the interviews because they did, because they always wanted second interviews when they'd come to town. But for some reason, I was the only VJ never hosted an I and I. I and I's were where they bring in a, uh, a band or a singer and they would uh, do a live interview and performance show with them and usually pack the house with fans and pack the street with fans. And it was a big deal. Those were big events. And never ever did I get to host one, which just sucked. Because there were some there were some artists there that wanted me to host it, but that got the kibosh. So that never happened. I uh, I never got a uh, farewell when I quit much music because I didn't quit under good circumstances. I didn't like management, but others left not really particularly happy. But they got big farewells, big farewell specials. I didn't because they wanted to keep using my content as if I was still there live. They wanted to keep running the fromage marathons. They wanted to keep running my other shows. They wanted to pretend that I was still there because they didn't want the, the blowback about me quitting. So <clears throat> I just continued to do my late night show on city TV, but left much music. And then years later, when much had, had changed a lot, they uh, approached me about coming back. <clears throat> this is when the management that I didn't like was gone. And I almost came back. I, I did one appearance on the Much On Demand show, um, which they changed it to something else, Live at Much. They, no, what did they call it? I'm just still gonna call it Much On Demand because that's all that it was. So they were, they, I did one appearance there. It got front page news in the Toronto Star. It did really well, people were very excited. And then just as we were about to arrange things, they decided to change their format and drop music. They decided they were going to just run comedy. And I thought, well, that's perfect anyways, because what I do is comedy. And they were like, no, we don't want people to see you and remember the old much music and how good it was, because then it'll look bad in comparison to what we're doing now. So that went out the window and uh, much music continued its downward slope till it dropped the name. Uh, it dropped the music from its name. It just became much, but which is funny because much was less and they stopped running videos and doing music content and put on reruns of South Park and the Simpsons and became a channel that nobody pays any attention to. Yeah, nah, it's pretty crazy, you know, because I think at that time too, it was run by like City TV and now it's owned by Bell, like, which is probably like like one of the worst uh, corporations like in the history of mankind for television, so. Well, you know what? They're not any worse than any other. It's, uh, the industry has just dried up and died. They're still making shows and they're still making uh, some good quality shows. The problem is they're only making it the big expensive shows. They no longer invest in things that are more modestly budgeted, like a much music or like those shows that, uh, those smaller shows that Canadian TV used to produce. So, you know, Bell is just a corporation. Their bottom line is making money. I think like many uh, of its peers, uh, Chorus, Rogers, they don't understand is that you can cut jobs and that reduces your overhead, but it doesn't actually create any new product for you. And so it doesn't generate income. You're better off making, keeping the staff there and creating programming uh, on various levels of expense 
that will generate income and generate revenue. Yeah, no, I feel you. And you know, like even like you said with contacting some of like the BJs back then, because I, I think back then it was only like cell phone and like not cell phone, but like telephone and like letters that you can contact now. But now it's well, like it email. Media. There was email, a lot of email. Oh, true. I mean, yeah. when I started there, there wasn't email. When I started there, it was all, you know, mail in letters. We used to open up the envelopes and read the letters, which was, to be honest with you, a lot cooler than emails because people used to send in drawings and uh, they'd send in art pieces that they made. And you can't do that over email. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. Um, also, um, so Master T, like, he wrote like a memoir back then of his experience in much called Much Master T, like one VJ's journey. Um, like, I don't know if you managed to read that memoir by any chance. And if so, did you feel like it was like an accurate representation of what life was like working for Much back then? No, I didn't read it. Oh, true. My uh, thought was I was there and lived it. So now I imagine that seeing it from T's point of view would be very interesting. And I may at some point pick it up, but uh, no, I didn't read it. So I can't answer the other questions. <laughs> no worries, no worries. So we can get back on to what's happening now with music, with New Music Nation and with what's going on with Much Now. So let's talk about New Music Nation first. So since it's only allowing music videos from like non-industry promoted, like independent artists, what made you decide on like on that rather than allowing like you know established like industry promoted independent acts like have i mighty arkells for like music video placements well you see people like the arkells they have uh uh as i understand it they have a contract with a with a record company they mm -hmm. don't need like the record company is there doing the heavy lifting uh, of promotion for them and one of the people I'm interested in are the people who don't have record company contracts, who have nobody helping them. They are, they're out there toiling, putting out good music, putting out good music videos, and nobody sees it because there's no promotion for them. So I'm more interested in helping those who don't have any other help. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. And I realized it too, like when I was like watching like uh, the episodes day by day, like especially like with the hip hop ones. Yeah. Like I noticed it's like more artists coming from more rural areas in Canada, like with St. Catharines, Niagara Falls, like Saskatoon, uh, like Alberta, like Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, like usually in other areas, you know, like the main hubs for like independent acts are usually coming from like, Toronto like Vancouver, like Montreal, like even like some parts of like Calgary, like, do you feel that's like kind of like an interesting like aspect to it? Like seeing like other people from other hubs of Canada, like getting that shine, like rather than like those like major like cities? Well, that's the part of the goal of doing uh, promotion for artists who don't have promotion is yeah, we're gonna grab people from areas that don't have the, the mechanisms to promote the artists. So yeah, we're gonna get people from all the places you talked about and from places in uh, Yukon and Northwest Territories, places don't, don't, that don't usually get representation, we're giving that representation. So yeah, uh, that's part of the, that's, that means what we're doing is working because also agents who book bands are watching our shows and they're booking bands that they see on the shows. So it's making it easier for agents to give gigs to the, the performers who are on our shows. And it's giving the performers the chance to get gigs they otherwise wouldn't have got. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. Um, just by like your analysis, um, have you ever had like any like favorite like videos so far, so far from like the new Music Nation channel, like by any chance? You know, it's, I, I hate to mention too many favorites because there is just so much. We at this point have over 850 videos that have been submitted and I haven't seen all of them yet. And I mean, there were, there are some that, that jump out at me. Um, there's one called the North Sound. The guy's name is Forest Eagle Feather. He happens to be indigenous. 
He produces some really beautiful music. Um, the Mighty Rhino is a guy from Toronto, the most un... You wouldn't expect this guy to be doing hip hop and doing it well, but he does. And his videos are very, very joyous. That's what I love about them is they're so positive and so joyous. Um, Major Funk, I like. Uh, the uh, Confusion Airs. Um, uh, Moore Street Underground. There's a Moore Avenue Underground. I forget. It's one. It's more something underground. Like them very much. Uh, the Shit Bats. I like. Um, there. I'm sure there's many, many more. Like I said, there's so many out there. I can only grasp so many at a time. But there are there are many that I really, I really. A Bad Holiday is another one. There's a rapper named Confidential, who uh, we haven't had on yet because of uh, rights issues with his music, but he's really, really good. No doubt. I think one of like the music videos that actually hit me was from actually with one of your hosts um, from uh, London, Ontario. Like I think in one episode so where someone. they did, uh, like, I think she's like one of the hosts like for London, like for London, Ontario, like that. Yeah, her name is someone. Oh, someone. Yeah, yeah. So someone. So she dropped like a very like dope music video that I've noticed, which talked about like women's issues and, you know, the issues of like kidnapping and, you know, human trafficking. Like I kind of like the visuals and like the aspect of the message for a bit too. Like it kind of had like an interesting tone because you don't really get to hear it from a lot of like Canadian well, no, acts. She, she's original. She is definitely one of the people I should have mentioned first as far as favorites. I loved her material when I saw it, and that's why I asked her to host uh, Rhapsody, our rap show. She is the real deal. She's a super talent. Her, uh, her, her songs and her videos are top quality, um, and uh, she's, she's just the real deal. She's really great. No doubt. No doubt. Um, you know, just to end off on part one uh, with uh, much using like TikTok now, because like recently they're using TikTok instead of the actual like television program to recreate the platform. Did you feel like that Bell Media used the wrong repro uh, approach to revitalizing the platform to incorporate it on like TikTok or live television? Well, you know what? They can do what they want to do. They... Uh... They have their goals, their strategies. They don't do things, as far as I understand it, they don't do things willy-nilly. They've got, they've got a plan and they've got a strategy. I myself wouldn't have done it the way they're doing it because Much Music is a brand that doesn't mean anything to the people who watch TikTok. So it's curious to me why they decided to go that route, but I wish them luck. No doubt, no doubt. And I guess you're not like a very big fan of like TikTok and all that. Oh, I don't, I'm not, a, I'm not, not a fan. I'm not a fan. I, it's just another platform that's out there. People enjoy it and that's what matters. <laughs> no doubt. I get you. So moving on to part two, which is more based on like mainstream media and cancel culture. So getting on with like cancel culture, like how big are you on like cancel culture? Like, you know, like uh, pretty much about it. Well, I mean, there's, there's cancel culture, which is people who get um, too, too, too demanding that other opinions don't exist in their view. They don't want to see uh, other opinions. They don't want to see people who express opinions they don't like. Um, and they're shutting, down, uh, they're shutting down speech. They're shutting down the exchange of ideas. That is cancel culture. Then there's people who legitimately want to shut down voices of hate and are using their voice uh, to say, don't listen to this other voice. And that's just democracy. No doubt. Um, so like starting with it, like in that sense too. Um, so the baby, like one of like the biggest rappers, like in this generation right now was accused of making like, homophobic and like derogatory comments in regards to HIV and AIDS and sexual encounters between like two men at Rolling Loud just like maybe like a week or two ago. Um, so how do you feel about like situations like that? And do you feel that council culture is more to get artists to be held accountable for their actions or 
you know, tarnishing their brand with no substantive like evidence in that sense? Well, in general, it's both. Um, there are times when they reach back years and find a comment somebody made years ago and use that against them now when these people's opinions have changed and evolved and the world was a different place back then. Common understanding and common belief in what was okay in discourse was different. And to pull back something from like 10 years ago and use it against somebody now, that's bullshit. But, yeah. the, uh, but as far as doing stuff today, which is say anti-gay, well, he has a right to express his views and we have a right to express our views that his views are repugnant. And if we're saying, hey, don't listen to this guy, he's hateful, that's just our right to do. That, I don't consider that cancel culture, that's a reaction to what the guy did. And every action has a, has a reaction. Yeah, no doubt. I feel you because like recently, like a lot of people had to like educate like the people like aware of what he said. So Elton John spoke about it. Uh, Madonna spoke about it. And like a lot of people like in the pop industry uh, who are like pro LGBTQ have been speaking about situations like this. And it led to him getting uh, deals from uh, Bonnaroo like canceled and him being taken off on like Park Live Music Festival and just recently uh, Lollapalooza which he was supposed to perform today but like he got removed so do you that's, like con that's the consequence he's allowed to express his views but there are consequences for your views and that's yeah. what this is true but I do feel like nowadays too like I think there kind of has like there is like a weird balance in some cases too because you could allow someone to be canceled in like one viewpoint, but if you're working with someone else that also has that same viewpoint, but not canceling them, you know, you can't like really play like both sides in that no, sense. There has like, to be consistency. Yeah. If an individual finds something uh, distressing or objectionable, they have to find that objectionable no matter who does it. Now, context is very important. Simply using a word isn't enough to cancel someone in my view. Um, you have to understand the context that they're using the word because context is extremely important and context has been lost. Nowadays, it's just, did somebody say a word ever? Did somebody express an opinion ever? It doesn't matter what the context was. It doesn't matter if they were joking. It just, they just come down like a hammer on them and that's wrong. Yeah, pretty much. And I did, I do feel like that they made the right approach for not allowing him to perform and taking away these brands because in some cases too, you do have to learn from your mistakes as well. Like I do feel like with cancel culture, there also has to be a subset to educating like the person making these claims or accusations, you know? So I do feel it is like a good approach to have one side or the other, you know, you could have cancel culture, like in a sense, if it's wrong or unacceptable, but, also, you might have to educate them in that sense, too, so that they won't make the same mistakes. So uh, with um, Simone Biles, like withdrawing from the Olympics to focus on her mental health, how do you feel about how do you feel about situations like this? And if sports should focus more on mental health for players? Well, I mean, in general, mental health is still stigmatized. People who have problems with mental health, even though I would say that probably the majority of people have some mental health uh, challenge, uh, even if they don't aren't aware of it, they just think that they have bad moods or they have, they get sad. They go to, people don't realize that, that mental health problems are fairly common and they're not all extreme. They're not all crippling. They're not all debilitating, but they're, they're there. And especially with athletes who are driven so hard by their coaches, often by their parents, and by their sponsors. Um, I'm surprised more of them don't crack. And I think that what Simone Biles did was very brave, very smart, and hopefully will set a, uh, a pattern going forward of people saying, look, I can't do this. I might hurt myself if, you know, physically if I do this because, you know, she was not in her right focus and doing those, the kind of uh, gymnastics she's doing, if you lose yourself, you could wind up paralyzed um, or dead. So 
she did the smart thing. And definitely we need to keep removing the stigma of mental health and allowing people to say, okay, I'm, I'm not okay right now. No doubt, no doubt. And, you know, I, you know, I've been asking this for many people like in the industry as well as other uh, platforms. So, you know, with the Me Too and Time's Up movement like happening, uh, what are your thoughts on those movements? And do you feel that it's something that is needed to happen for like any industry? Well, it was, yeah, it was necessary. I think like all movements, all movements, they, they crest and then they recede. Um, and, but I think that the people who were caught by this, uh, the Me Too movement and Time's Up movement were repeat offenders who were so powerful that nobody complained about them. And uh, I'm glad that, that that it happened. I think that it's, it's now growing. So it's not just harassment uh, directed at women, but it's harassment directed at employees and staff, which is so common, not just in entertainment, but I, you know, it's, it's gotta be time's up for harassment of any kind. And it's gotta be like enforced. There needs to be consequences when people are being abused. No doubt. Uh, just to add on with that one question, you know, with Bill Cosby, you know, being released uh, from prison, like, you know, because of uh, the five uh, witnesses trying to claim with that uh, one, like, uh, plaintiff, uh, do, you, do you feel like it's kind of like a slap in the face, like in the Me Too movement, like, like in that sense, for what they needed to do? What, him being released? Uh, well, yeah. Well, him being released is because uh, somebody in in uh, the prosecutorial arm of the justice system made a promise to him that they should never have made. So him being released is what had to happen because a legal promise was made to him. And you can't, I don't want a system that makes a promise to somebody then goes back on it. That's worse for the entire system than letting Bill Cosby out of jail. Bill Cosby's still in jail. He's just in a very nice cage. Nobody <laughs> wants to associate with him. The man is blind. I don't think he's got many, uh, he's got much, much more time on this world. So um, yeah, I think that uh, what was done was necessary, but putting him in jail served a purpose for the time that he was there and it sent a message. Yeah. Um, and so, um, What's your advice to any person or anyone like willing to pursue their dreams? Well, pursue them, but you've got to take a, a good sober look at the industry itself, at what it really takes to get into it, uh, what you're willing to put in, because you've got to be honest about your, you know, your energies and your focus and the amount of time you're able to, to put into it. Um, you, should, you should follow your dreams but dreams shouldn't be a dream in the sense of it's something completely unrealistic. Dreams should be replaced by goals. It's good to have goals, but dreams often lead people down paths they shouldn't go down because they're not looking at the path with clear eyes. They're looking at it through rose colored glasses. So it's important to have goals. I don't know if it's important to have dreams. All right. And um, at the SOC, uh, thank you uh, for coming by. You know, it was just an, an amazing podcast. And I hope all is going to be well for you uh, throughout like, uh, the rest of the year and everything else, too. And this is TLOI Talks Episode 3. And Josh, signing off. Thanks, Josh.